areas in the church that can go awry if there's no accountability. And when I got here, this was commonplace. Uh, so I think it's just a good idea. Why not disclose the finances of the church? Uh, everybody's accountable. You know where the money's going. Um, the church is unique in that all people that are tithing or giving are contributing to that. So um, you need to know where the money is going that, that you give. That's my opinion. But I think the scripture bears that out. Is there's a responsibility for the church to give and for a leadership to allocate that and be good stewards of that. So anyway, we still do that. And as long as I'm here, as far as I know, um, we're still going to disclose everything. I don't see a reason not to. I just have never understood that. So anyway, that's the budget. And I appreciate Miss Diane doing that and Sandy's Diane's assistant and appreciate all the hard work that they do pulling that together. So please take a look at that while we get started. We're going to have prayer. And then I'm just going to ask our leadership, our team leaders to come and give report. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, bear with us. Um, most of the time, this only takes a few minutes and then we'll jump into our Bible study. So we have other stuff planned, uh, but you're welcome to just sit back and and join us. And I did want to let y'all know that uh, Tom and Helen Hurl have sent some updates uh, about their ministry and things going on there with the children and so forth. I would like to share that Sunday instead of tonight, just to include everybody in that. But uh, if they are watching, I will uh, be sharing that with the church, uh, Lord willing, Sunday morning. Uh, they just sent some in the last day or two. And they're in the Philippines as missionaries. And if you don't know, um, Tom Hurl is James Hurl's brother that plays the guitar up here. So that's the connection there. And they've been in uh, the Philippines as missionaries for several years now. I don't remember how long, but maybe they could give us the details. Let me pray with you, and then we'll start our reporting time, okay? All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your, your grace and your patience and your mercy. I thank you for your love and, and for your holiness. And Sometimes we forget that part, and I thank you that you are who you are, and I pray that you would continue to work here at Homewood to glorify yourself and further the kingdom, and I pray that um, things that we talk about tonight and discuss would um, move us forward in our journey with you and our ministry here at Homewood and in this community. I pray that you would give us ideas and visions and um, strengthen our, our faith. Sometimes, Lord, we stop at whatever our... Um, abilities are or resources help us to go as far as you take us and have faith enough to know that you'll provide as we go lord i pray that you would continue to be with those on a prayer list and those uh, in the hospital and going through surgeries and different things even today i pray that uh, they would feel your your presence and trust in you and turn to you for their strength lord. in jesus name amen. all right so i'm going to turn it over to the the leaders, and then we'll get back to the budget, uh, the last thing as far as the body life meeting part. So uh, who'd like to lead us all, team leaders? Roberta, you're closest. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, that's what you get for I'm going to start sitting in the front. back. Tell them who you are. They know who I am. <laughs> She's just there. No, I'm not broken. <laughs> Okay, first and foremost, I want to thank all the members of our team. George Eaton, our faithful bus driver. Judy Fisher for overseeing our donuts, bingo, and decorations. Helen Hardwick for arriving early and making our coffee to have with our donuts. And for Mary Keenan for handling all our trip plans and accounting needs. I would be lost without each and every one of you. We continue our second Tuesday morning group time with Donuts Movie and Lunch. On May 9th, we watched the movie Rust, starring, directed by, and produced by Corbin Burnson. We had lunch at Dale's in Tabor City. On May 25th, we had a lunch picnic at the picnic shelter with 12 people. On June 13th, we watched the movie Raising Izzy, a movie about two orphan sisters and the caring teacher who changed their lives. We had lunch at Quincy's in Florence with 11 people. On June 22nd, we had a pizza party with 11 people. On July 11th, we watched the movie Pardoned by Grace, A True Story, starring Joey Lawrence, 
The movie was based on a true story of Scott Heiberger's transformation from a man who ran from God into a man who brought thousands to him while in and out of prison himself. We had lunch at Saltwater Grill and Longs with nine in attendance. On July 20th, we took a trip to McLeod Farms. We had, that was in McBee, South Carolina. We had lunch, bought peaches and other produce, and of course, we had ice cream. We had 11 people attending. Our plan for August is to go out to breakfast at Nanny Annie's on August 8th, and then to take a trip to Calabash, North Carolina, for shopping at Callahan's and lunch at the Sunnyside Up Diner on August 24th. Got any questions for Roberta? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Roberta, who can be in this group? Who can be in the seniors group? I don't know. Probably 55 and over. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And it doesn't cost anything on their normal things like here at the church building. The, the movie, the donuts, and so forth. But when you go on trips, um, they tell you if it's going to cost something or, or whatever. But they have a great time. The last time they went, I thought I was going to go, but I, at the last minute I decided not to go. And um, I did get one peach out of that, but no ice cream. They sent me pictures. How cruel. But anyway, <laughs> they have a great time. <laughs> it was my fault, wasn't it? So if you're, if you're not a part of this group, uh, think about it. Just think about coming. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good time. They have a, a good time. It's a good group, good fellowship. All right, who next? Uh, either deacons or person or uh, property maintenance. Yeah, Jack. I first had my question. <laughs>
let me know that uh, if Adina, me, uh, George, Ken, and Mr. Hurl are all members of that committee, and you can let any one of us know, and, and uh, we'll uh, definitely look into whatever it is you want to bring uh, to us. We can't see all the things we don't. Uh, sometimes things get prioritized and other things get pushed on down the line, but uh, if you would give us that information, it would help us. And uh, we may be overlooking something because we can't see the forest from the trees kind of thing. But just to let us know and, and anything you can help us with, the eyes and ears, uh, for pointing out stuff that we need to be doing before it gets to a point where it's, you know, it's kind of not maintenance, it's repair. Pretty much where we are with that. It's been a, a slow process for the last three or four months, but we're finally getting some movement. We're willing to we'll get it done. Right. Now, do you have any questions? Besides the pastor. <laughs> Did y'all hear? Did y'all hear? Yeah. Okay. I turned the mic up. Did you understand what he was saying about the room back here? You know, good? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And um, a lot of times, property maintenance, I turned it up for him, I was too bad. A lot of times, property maintenance will be here when we're all gone. Like Jack was this past week, and George is up here, and several others come up here to work on vehicles, or take vehicles, or to work on lights, or whatever. Um, and it's an ongoing thing. Maintenance is ongoing in a building like this. Um, the only reprieve you get is as soon as you build it. It's, everything's new. But after a while, especially 25 years now, something like that, in this building, uh, things start to go. The ballast and the lights and so forth. So they have a very important job. They're doing, doing well. And um, so encourage them. But like Jack said, if you see something that needs attention, uh, let them know. Okay. I was going to tell them there's a light bulb out in the ladies' restroom with a lamp, but then I figured I'd have to explain how I know there's a <laughs> light bulb in the lamp. Sunday mornings I turn all the lights on. That's how I know. <laughs> Anything else from property maintenance? Okay. Who else? Nobody else is here? No, 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 no more leaders? Okay, um, Ms. Ladina has had eye surgery. Because I'm staff, uh, she's leading our worship team uh, because I don't get a vote in the leadership team meeting and there's just a thing there, it's a little awkward. So she's, she's right now our team leader, but she's had surgery on her eye and she's doing real well. She said the next thing is removing the wrinkle from the left eye, um, which just, just hurts. About, but she's doing good. Um, and Doris was here at the meeting last night for our children. Um, we've got things going on there. Um, anybody else have a report before I give you mine or just update you on some things going on? You got anything from the deacons, James? Yeah, we got a lot going on, but we ain't ready to reveal it right now. It's all top secret. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you keep it right there. You keep it to yourself. <laughs> uh, the deacons, I'm sorry, I turned Jack, I mean, um, George, can you turn, or Sandy, can you turn that down? Thank you. I turned it up for Jack, and I got it too loud for me. Um, I do want to share some things with you. We met. Uh, last night was a special meeting specifically for homecoming and fall festival. Um, you just said it wherever you need me there, George. <laughs> um, I turned it off. <laughs> no, that's what I'm afraid of. Um, the, uh, we talked about our celebration. We had a picnic shelter for the 4th of July celebration. Uh, we had almost 90 people there, 87. That's what we counted at one point. Um, we uh, had a great fellowship time, uh, including Emmanuel's congregation that joined us, and it was just a good, a good experience. And we want to have more of those uh, outings and so forth. 
Um, I have found out recently that we have a church member who's in need of a ramp and a handrail. Several years ago, we built multiple ramps for different folks that needed them. So I just became aware of this. So, fellas, uh, I wanted to get with y'all and see if we can't organize a, uh, a time where we can go over and build a ramp and a handrail um, at this house. I'll talk to you about that later. Um, our homecoming is going to be September the 17th. September the 17th, which is not far off. And our Sunday school worship will be at the same time, regular time. And we want some local talent, uh, if you can sing, play an instrument, to help us in that worship time. So um, you might get asked, but I'd rather you just come up and say, I have a song I'd like to share. So if, if anyone can sing or play or want to sing a duet or something like that, just please let me know. Um, let us know. Hey, y'all can sing. Um, that's right. You can dance. Um, so that's a Sunday? That is a Sunday. A homecoming is when we have our uh, regular Sunday school time and worship, but it's usually we send out invitations to those who have been a part of Homewood in years past, and we have visitors uh, usually that we don't see but once a year sometimes, and we eat immediately afterwards. And we'll do the same thing this year that we did last year and that we'll have the round tables and chairs already set up in here when we come in for worship. Uh, what the team decided on uh, last night was uh, on Friday night, Friday night at 7, we will come in here and set up everything. So all these cloth chairs will go in the closets, the vinyl chairs and the round tables will come out. That's Friday night. The next morning at 8, which is a Saturday morning, we'll set up the tent out here just in this grassy area like we've done before. And then that way, Saturday day, the hostess team and whomever else can help them can decorate in here. So Sunday morning, everything be ready to go. And uh, we'll talk more about what to bring as far as food. And we'll have our service. And we'll get our food like we did last time, bring it back in here or underneath the tent outside. and Or maybe even, as was suggested, maybe in some of the rooms back there if we need that for overflow and just have a time of fellowship and, and um, reminiscing. And that's when we have some pictures and things of the past. And okay, Steve, for entertainment, we do have a comedian here. You do? <laughs> comedian. We've never had that, so that would be yeah. good. We're going to have puppets. We can have puppets and comedian. <laughs> um, and also, uh, on that, after that homecoming day, we will begin to bring our items for the fall giveaway that week. So that will be the start of the fall giveaway as far as bringing stuff in. And we will have assigned rooms this time, places to hang the clothing, and so it's a prep area and everything will get, you know, be organized uh, so it's not kind of all piled up at once. And I'll remind you later, this is not for us, so don't be stealing from the stuff that we bring to give away. <laughs> anyway, the giveaway is on uh, October uh, 28th. 28th. I didn't write down. October the 28th from 8 to 1. October 28th, 8 o'clock in the morning to 1 p.m. And again, we'll ask you to bring crock pots uh, with soup and uh, chili. Just simple things, soup, chili, and crackers. And we'll be serving that throughout until the food is gone. Um, and we'll be setting up a tent near the road. Um, Brother James is going to work on getting maybe a fire truck here, maybe a tractor. I'm going to be working on getting a police car in case y'all get out of hand. Uh, some other things to attract the children. Ms. Doris will be working on some things for the children, some activities for them. But um, the, the main focus is the giveaway and what we talked about last night is a reminder that this is our opportunity to share Christ with our community. That's that's why we exist, is to share Christ with, with the community. So that's what that's we do. October. October. Okay. October the 28th. Yeah. Um, also, just um, as far as me personally, I've been meeting with some guys individually along the way for breakfast or lunch or just... Uh, just meeting to see if we can't move forward in our walk with Christ and I have uh, begun a, a group text with some guys uh, to continue a Bible study in a group setting and a text format 
Um, so uh, that's the right way to put that. Um, this is uh, something that I enjoy doing, something I feel is a part of my calling, is, a, is discipling men one-on-one. -on -one. And this will allow us to deal with some scriptures uh, that they can respond to or not. Uh, it's uh, going to be a little laid back, but I meet with each of them individually. So I've asked uh, all of them, but maybe one, if, if they mind if we come together at least in that form and, and grow together. So I did want you to know that, that I try to work uh, constantly to meet with some of the guys and for the sole purpose of discipling, to grow in our walk together. Uh, so that's uh, brand new, just starting that. Uh, look at your budget, if you would. Do you have any questions or um, comments about your budget? This is, and again, these come out quarterly. This is the January to March, Steve. This one is the right one. There you go. Um, January through June. You don't have that. Okay. Any questions about that? Um, the Sandy explained to me about the adjustments from first quarter. If you look at missions, the very first item there, if you look at the, the bottom, um, it says the bottom of that first section, adjustment from first quarter. It was a computer glitch that left that second column out. So that's why there's an adjustment there. It's just how the spreadsheet worked at that particular time. That's all an adjustment there. It's just a computer thing. Is there anything on here that you have a question about or don't understand or want uh, clarity on? Um, Jack was talking about driveway repairs. Yes. Are there any already scheduled? Jack, um, she was asking about the driveway repairs and anything scheduled for that. Um, only because of the giveaway. We thought ahead yes. not to um, One of the things that they're having to do is to get soil samples first so that the, the company that does that professionally will tell us what's underneath and they will give a recommendation as to how we need to proceed. If I'm saying this right, Jack, how we need to proceed as far as removing what we have. See, the problem is not just replacement, but what do we do with all that concrete? We break it up, we walk with it, and then what do we do for a, 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 the first level, and then what comes next? Asphalt, concrete, or what? So I think the soil sampling is the first step. Is that right, Jack? Before you move forward in replacing or do anything with the... Okay. Okay. What has been done now, Marsha, uh, James has been um, taking the gravel out here and spreading it out to some of these holes that have become potholes. But yes, that's, that's been my first concern as far as safety. When we have uh, events and so forth, the parking lot is it, it's, it's getting worse and worse and, and it's just going to become a hazard. So that's, that's why they're working on that is seeing the best way and the most efficient way to do that. But it's very pricey. Um, I've seen some of those estimates, and it's very pricey. Uh, asphalt or concrete, either way, it's not cheap, but uh, they're trying to figure out how to best do that. But the, coal, the soil samples gives a better foundation. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes, you get their recommendation on what to do. Thank you, Jack. All right. Is, is the uh, Bethesda home the one with the babies? Mm -hmm. It is. And since you're here, Marcia, um, and <laughs> she's going globe trotting here shortly. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Hartford School situation with Homewood?
Some of the ladies went to a training session for Heart for Schools, which is a denominational thing that our convention uh, sponsors. Marsha is leading that uh, team. Uh, we'll be working with Homewood Elementary School, which is right up the road here, and working with, with them in whatever capacity the principal deems best, whether that's reading with the third graders, which we've done in the past, helping the faculty, the staff, reaching out to the parents, Whatever uh, the all principal, the yes, yeah, or all the above. And, and doing that, that's an outreach that we have because of our location and just the doors have opened there in the past. And, and in doing so, we have, uh, are hoping that and praying that through that, we'll be able to make contact with those families and those children and make, uh, establish a relationship and we want to schedule BBS for next year, right after school gets out, so that we can be talking about that, handing them information, whatever the principal allows us to do there on the, camp on the campus, so that um, that will be anticipated by the student body and we'll have children coming. We will have Bible school next year, Lord willing, and hopefully it'll be right after school is out. Uh, so that's the plan as far as children, and that's that's one of the things there. She's very excited about it in May. Good. So I'm sure that's she's great. Just busy, but I will, you know, try, I will, what I was hoping to do, if not meet with her before I go, at least set up a time yes. for us all to okay. sit. So if I can even just talk to her on the phone and, and set the groundwork. That'd be great. Get, get ideas from her what it is she's wanting us. And if she needs, if we can meet with her or something while you're, Gone oh, absolutely. while you're just gallivanting yeah, all over the world, um, let us know why don't you meet with him, but, um, that'd be great. Also, uh, as far as prayer concerns and also something that we've talked about is a ministry. Um, it's uh, not coastal evangelism, but it's uh, a coastal outreach uh, in schools. Uh, right now, the students here in Horry County can have an accredited class, a Bible study class, but it cannot be on their campuses. I didn't realize this has been going on for a while, but what our denomination and what other churches uh, are helping with in, in right now in the county is we are providing transportation to go to the schools, bus the kids to a neutral place, which I think Langston is one of the ones that is providing a place for them to meet. They go there, they have a one hour class, an accredited class, and the churches are responsible for busing them back to their, their um, campuses. They do get credit, and there's a waiting list. Students want to come to these classes. It's a travesty that they can't have a Bible study class on their campuses. It's been kicked out. So, but the positive is they're still allowed to go. So we're thankful for that. And from what I understand, they need more churches to put it in their budget to help with this because the churches have to fund it 100%. The transportation, the buses, the drivers, the curriculum, everything. So you'll hear more about that as we find out more. But at one time, they were looking at their old bus as a possibility. But um, I haven't heard anything about that recently. But there is some, some ministries going on for children. That's why I want to share that with you. Anything else we need to report in our body lifetime, the reporting time? saying James and that's come up before too is that if you allow one religion you allow other religions which that's a long discussion but anyway um, but I'm thankful that they're doing this and the churches are providing and reaching out and there is a, a waiting list uh, for students that want to take part you have any questions for me any concerns or any uh, ideas anything that comes to mind. I just got a question on that, what y'all were talking about. We got two cousins. I didn't know you were, you talked about picking them up at all different schools or locations or mm -hmm. did churches organize before they could all at one pick them up at one place. I just didn't you know, had any details on how you were going about it. It might There's have an effect on keeping both vessels. It's 
it's established in some communities like Hainer and Carolina Forest. I don't know so much about Conway right now, but they're trying to have enough buses and enough drivers to offer this course. I was told that there were, I can't remember the amount now, was it over 100 or 200 uh, students on a waiting list that wanted this class, that we just didn't have enough transportation and, and drivers to get them to the locations. Um, to take part in that. So uh, it is being, uh, I'm not doing it, uh, I forget who's heading it up, but it's it's well organized and they need more buses and more drivers. Is there a specific age group? It's middle school and high school from what I understand. Middle school and high school. Meeting how often? Once a week. I, I think it is once a week. Um, I'm not certain. Um, yes, Jim. We used to go after our old church, we used to go to uh, Carolina Forest Elementary School, but right off of 501, and uh, it was Child Evangelism Fellowship. And, and I know they lasted a few years, and then it ended. Right, and that is a little different because it is geared to the children. Um, this is coastal. I can't think of it now. It's something with coastal in the in the name, but the same kind of idea as they go there and, and, and minister to the kids. But this is for the high school and I think middle school. One, one more question. This is the middle of the day school hour time. time yes. Time, time. Okay. yes. Yeah, this is during their regular class times. Yeah, that's why it's important to have a place like Langston that's close by because they have to get them there one hour class and get them back for their next class. Mm -hmm. This would never happen up north, just so you know. Really? Oh. So we're thankful to have it here. All right, well, if there's no other thing, and if um, when we announce that we have our team leaders meetings, if you ever want to know what's going on, just ask. Our, our minutes are provided. If you have questions about like um, detailed stuff, like the parking lot, or um, just ask um, whoever's in charge of that or whoever's on that team. Um, we don't want the congregation to be in the dark, just the opposite. I want the congregation to be involved. Um, so you need to be on a team. If you're not on a team, search around and see, ask somebody, how can I serve, where can I serve? And if you're on a team, then that team leader sh should be giving you information to keep you informed as to what's going on. For instance, for homecoming? I made a copy of this for each of the members. Oh, you of did? The senior. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Roberta. Um, okay, Roberta made a list of uh, the notes from the team leader stuff and what's coming up for homecoming and yard sale and so, or the yard giveaway, fall giveaway. Um, so I don't want I want you to be in the dark. I want you to, to to be informed of what's going on and what the plans are. I know there are plans. There is a vision. There there are things happening. Okay, you ready for your Move into our video. Um, this video, this part is going to talk about financial crisis as part of prophecy, a financial chaos, anything from Bitcoin to the mark of the beast um, to um, stuff that we're seeing today, even already. Uh, he'll, Dr. Jeremiah will talk about the chip and what's already being used in some places in the world, like in Sweden. Um, how our financial situation and systems coming together to fit uh, what prophecy talks about. Uh, I've told you about our phones before, and I noticed this the other day. When we met with some folks that we grew up with in Kannapolis. Uh, we had lunch with them. Uh, she was our, she's 91. She was our children's director and, and music leader. She still plays the piano at the church she attends. And her daughter came with her. We haven't seen each other in years. And as we sat down for lunch and we were talking, uh, we mentioned a couple that we used to have uh, at the church there uh, when we were attending as children. When I got home, I was sitting on the couch, and I opened Facebook up, and that couple's picture came up on Facebook. I hadn't talked about them, mentioned their name in years. And I uh, heard, well, as a matter of fact, Dr. Jeremiah will mention this too, if you knew what information was being passed through your phones, it would scare you. 
So things are already in place. Things are already working. And so we're going to, we're going to talk about this from the text of the 13th chapter of the Revelation. 13th chapter of Revelation, and he'll add some other verses as well, passages, but I'm going to play here as much as I can. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I'll get to at least 20 minutes of the video. So take notes, because we're probably not going to have much time to talk about it, but take notes as you watch the video, okay? And we should be, just as they're spying on us, we can use it to our advantage. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, do my I, I don't know who's listening, but they need to know we're still here. That's right. I'm sorry? Yes, just remind me. Thank you. Stylishly bearded and wearing a baseball cap, Juan Osterlin pulls on a pair of surgical gloves and uses a wipe to sterilize the top of his client's hand. Then with a quick jab, Osterlin inserts a preloaded syringe into the man's skin, and the man gasps as a tiny microchip about the size of a grain of rice and encased in a silicate glass enters his body. It invisibly embeds itself in his hand as the man exclaims, I'm a cyborg. So what do you think? Is that clip from a horror movie or a dystopian television show? Or could it be from the nightly news? Well, this procedure didn't take place in a dark movie or in the middle of a criminal lair. It happened in the clean and bright offices of a company in Sweden specializing in biochips. The company is called Biohacks International. It's where Osterlund is the CEO. And he estimates that he has chipped more than 6,000 Swedes during the six years his company has been in business. The microchip that he injects into clients uses radio frequency technology, and you might have a similar chip in your dog or your cat. Chipping pets is a popular way of tracking them if they ever get lost. Some of you probably know about that. But human microchipping is more sophisticated, and it offers a broader range of applications. The chip can be used to open secure doors or log into computers. All you have to do is just wave your hand. It can be used for contactless payments. When the chip is linked with bank or credit accounts, users can access funds by swiping their hand over the payment terminals. Actual credit cards are no longer needed. The technology has literally gotten under your skin. And it's coming soon to a hand near you. Embedded microchips will offer you a world without keys, wallets, or other encumbering items. A world where everything is accessible, which is the touch. In the future, such biochips will detect illness, monitor your vital signs, and send instant messages to your doctor. Of course, they could potentially be used to track your movements, to reveal your secrets, inform a totalitarian government what you're feeling and saying. This is both exciting and frightening at the same time. Osterlin believes his company's success is connected to Sweden's culture of embracing new technology technology that still frightens people in other parts of the world. The geopolitical situation historically gives us the kind of initial higher trust in the government, he said. I think a lot of people would be way more apprehensive in a lot of countries than we are here in Sweden. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm very apprehensive about that. It's bad enough what they can do through your cell phone. In fact, I'll tell you right now, I know enough about what's happening that you have no idea what's going on right now just with your cell phone and other devices that you have that you think you're totally under control. Well, maybe you're thinking, doesn't the Bible say something about this sort of thing? Haven't I heard about something being stamped on our hands or on our foreheads? Yeah, you have. You're right, the evolving biometric chip technology reminds us of a prophecy that's found in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 17. 
is a passage predicting something that will happen at the end of history during the Great Tribulation. Now, having heard the story I've told you about what's happening in Sweden, listen carefully to these words from the Scripture. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Could the technology being produced by Osterlin and many others be a foreshadowing of this mark of the beast we read about in the book of Revelation? That's really worth considering, so we're going to do that today. This technology is coming more quickly than we know. It's ahead of schedule, and I suspect we'll soon be facing some personal choices here in this country with regard to this technology. The appeal and the convenience of these innovations is palpable. Just think about people like me. I can never find my keys. They're lost most of the time. Just think about the convenience of not ever losing your keys because they've sewed it into your hand. That would seem like a good thing, but the downside of it would not be worth the risk. Just think about this technology in the wrong hands. Could it lead us toward the day when a centralized government will control, attack, punish, and monitor all of us? So yes, without being dogmatic or alarmist, it feels like biometric chips could be a precursor of Revelation 13. And we'll look at that and its ramifications a little bit more later on in this message. But for now, I want you to consider Osterlin's claim that people in some countries might be apprehensive of having microchips or similar technologies embedded in their skin. Is he correct? Are people pushing back at invasive technology? Doesn't look like it to me. I mean, we talk about it. People say they're upset about it, but nothing ever happens. I see multitudes of people, entire nations, choosing to hardwire their lives to devices and move the physical world toward digital without even looking back. And this includes digitizing our relationships, our news, our entertainment, our politics, our health, and yes, even our money. The move toward electronic finances began back in the early 1900s. Department stores and a few gas companies began issuing their own proprietary cards. In 1946, John Biggins introduced charging cards, and the Diners Club card showed up in 1950. American Express came along in 1958, and soon thereafter, credit card companies introduced the idea, very lucrative for them, of revolving credit. I hope that doesn't give you a sick feeling in your stomach when I say that. With the onset of the internet, everything became digitalized. Today, like it or not, we're all relying on the security and trustworthiness of electronic systems and massive banks to manage our savings and handle our finances. Few people are stuffing cash under their beds anymore. They're not stockpiling physical commodities like gold, jewels, or currency. And most workers get their salaries now as direct deposits into their bank accounts, which they access through websites and smartphone apps. We can buy almost anything we want with the click of a mouse or the tap of a finger, downloadable entertainment, mutual funds, household items, and even entire homes. Cash and checks are practically obsolete. Remember those birthday cards with a special slot for a check or a dollar bill? That's yesterday's gift. Now grandparents transfer money instantly through apps like PayPal or Zelle, and a growing number of churches collect their tithes through digital platforms. I don't have a problem with that. It sure does make people more faithful in their giving. But it's just another illustration of how we've made this massive switch from the way we used to do things, and we seem to be moving into this, this era of comfort with all kinds of digital transactions. One more item deserves mention. This is pretty up to date and pretty right on for right now, and that's the rise of all digital currencies, also known as cryptocurrencies. While national currencies such as the dollar or the euro are officially backed by government reserves, Digital currencies are decentralized. They don't have a physical foundation in gold or other tangible assets. Instead, 
Cryptocurrencies exist entirely in the world of cyberspace. They are produced online, stored online, and spent online. Incredibly, there are more than 6,500 cryptocurrencies circulating in the world today. Now, many see these digital currencies as the wave of the future. They imagine a world where physical currency has been entirely removed and all transactions are processed digitally. Many voices are even declaring the need for a central bank digital currency, CBDC, which would be a government-backed cryptocurrency designed to be the legal tender of a nation or perhaps even the entire world. More and more people in the Western world are buying, selling, and giving not with physical money, coins, and bills, but through a series of touches on a small screen. We love the convenience of managing our accounts from our palms. For the most of us, this technology is still on the outside of our hand in our smartphones, but it's only two millimeters from where Osterlund would like it to be, under our skin. What does all this mean for us for the future? And is it a sign of the end times? That's the question. How does this affect the followers of the land right now, today? Let's turn to scripture for some answers. What does this mean? Well, as we've seen throughout this message, it's difficult to make definitive statements about future events. There are so many variables at play. Even when we have general principles and prophecies from God's word to guide us, we have to be careful about turning those principles and those prophecies into specific predictions about people, places, and events. So I don't want to leave the impression today that a Swedish biochip is necessarily and definitively the biblical mark of the beast. I don't really believe that. But it's hard not to see some obvious trend lines. And there's one thing I can say with confidence. Money will play an essential role in all of the events of the future, including the end times. There's a couple of chapters in the book of Revelation where the economic center of the world at that time, Babylon, is destroyed, and it occupies dozens of verses talking about the destruction of Babylon, the center of the monetary world. So, money's always been important in the past. Everything connected with economics is increasingly important today. But it's driving our world. I think we can assume money will remain important in the future and that it will dominate our world even more in days to come. Get ready. So the Bible is rich with information on this topic. Specifically, Scripture reveals that money will have an impact on the end times, both leading up to and during the period known as the Tribulation. Let's talk about three of the most important financial signs of the end time. Number one, the addiction to money. Can you be addicted to money? Do you know anybody that's addicted to money? 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of money. It's easy to think of Wall Street when we read these verses, but we also must grapple with this personally. Paul said, that the end times will be a period defined by rejecting what is good and running to embrace what is evil. And much of that will be centered on an ever-increasing appetite for money. That matches what Paul had previously written to Timothy, a verse that's often misunderstood, but listen to it carefully. For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I always like to tell people that Paul did not say that money was the root of all evil. How many of you know money is neutral? It's what we do with money that creates the issue. And Paul said in Timothy, it's not money that's evil, it's the love of money. I want you to listen to something that John Piper wrote about this. He said, God deals in the currency of grace, not in the currency of money. Money is the currency of human resources. So the heart that loves money is a heart that pins its hopes and pursues its pleasures and puts its trust on what human resources can offer. So the love of money is virtually the same as faith in money. Belief and trust and confidence and assurance that money will meet your needs and make you happy. And there are many, many people that you and I know, that's what drives their life. They believe that if they get enough of it, 
if they can just get a little bit more of it, and if they can store it away, they're going to be okay, and they'll be ready, and they can relax and not worry. And it seems like it takes them all their life to do it, and just when they get what they think is enough, they die. And they give that money to somebody else who hasn't worked for it and usually doesn't know what to do with it. And you know the story. There are so many people that you and I know who try to insulate themselves behind a fortress of materialism. They put their hope in money as a means for buying protection and purpose, power and pleasure. They wear money on their sleeves like cufflinks so others will think more highly of them or at least be envious of them. They invest everything in what is temporary and completely ignore what is eternal. Our addiction to wealth will only grow stronger as we approach the end of history. So let me just say to you today, don't let it happen to you. This is our culture, but it cannot be our character. Later in this message, I'll give you some safeguards that have helped me. You don't want to let money get control of your life. If you become addicted to money, it will ruin you and everyone around you. I've seen it over and over and over. It's just a sad thing to see people get addicted to money and you know in your heart that it's going to leave them empty and sad. Every day, if you watch the news, there's a story about that and you can study it for yourself. Then here's another thing that seems quite interesting because there's a lot of discussion about this right now. And that's the acceleration of inequality. shorten that and then the, after the acceleration of, of inequality it comes uh, talks about the acceptance or, of the antichrist or um, acceptance is not the right word there but um, uh, kind of an allegiance to the antichrist um, so there's a lot here uh, a lot going on any other ring a bell like uh, this is going on now and I can uh, identify with some of this happening now um, And by the way, this next part, the acceleration of inequality, goes back to what we talked about with socialism. He's talking about inequality in finances, that when socialism uh, comes about, it promises culture that everybody will be equal financially, but never is that the case. Always the government uh, gets the better end of the deal. And there's a graph in one of the books here that shows uh, how that um, breaks down 1%. And I'll show it to you later, but 1% of the population ends up at 44% or ended up at 44% of the total uh, finances. I wanted to read something to you before we do the prayer concerns and leave this with you. I meant to read it to you last time and didn't get to. This goes back to when we were talking about pandemics and um, things that happened and was that part of the end times and uh, how should we look at COVID and so forth. Something to think about is this, as bad as COVID-19 was and is, the 1918 flu pandemic was more deadly. Between 50 and 100 million people died, which represented 5% of the Earth's population at that time. Many of these were young people as soldiers from World War I returned to their homes all over the world unaware they were carrying a deadly virus. The crowded conditions in military camps contributed to its spread. The 1918 pandemic is often called the Spanish flu, but there's no reason to believe it originated in Spain. It sprang out of the European war with soldiers coming and going from many nations. 5% of the Earth's population, the Spanish flu. And I wanted to read that to you because we've talked here that sometimes when we think of the tribulation, we think of things that are going on already uh, all around the world, and we forget that some huge, uh, devastating things have already happened in this country. It's just COVID was one of the most devastating that we've experienced. And if you go back to World War II, World War I, Spanish flu, um, all kinds of things have happened uh, 
um, in the past that um, sometimes we need to just be reminded of. Uh, prayer concerns. Please add Miss Myra Hawkins to your prayer list. Leah Chapman, as I mentioned Sunday. Um, Garnett Bird, as you got the mass announcement, she and John have to spend the night. Matter of fact, she's just now getting ready for MRI. 8 p.m. for MRI. That's just weird. She's had meetings all during the day. Um, it looks like, from what her doctors are saying, there's a good opportunity, good possibility she could get this procedure. They will go into detail. But anyway, it, the outcome looks very positive for her. So, Also, uh, remember, continue to pray for Larry Harrington. Um, uh, Ken Peterson. Is, um, okay. He may still be in the hospital. Still, he may have come home. Um, I know that Ms. Meyer is still in the hospital. Um, others that we need to add to prayer list, Ms. Barbara. Um, her name is Ian Eckert. Uh, this is the son in law of a friend of Chris's. He's 24 years old with a brain aneurysm. And apparently went through about four hours of surgery today. They were not successful. Now, I think it's probably mental. Okay. It's Ian Eckert. A brain Ian Eckert, okay. Are there others? Miss Judy Conger is better. She does not have COVID. She just had a bug, I guess. Okay. Um, she wasn't up to coming tonight, but she'll probably be here Sunday. Okay. So pray for Judy. And when COVID breaks out in a, in a, in a group home or something of that nature, you know that it's, it just kind of yeah. red flags go up. Uh, Rhonda and Terry weren't here Sunday um, Rhonda had cold, Terry had flu, I mean, I'm not flu, I just read that, uh, stomach bug, um, but um, they're, they're doing much better. Um, what else? Yes, sir, Terry. We, we found out yesterday that these sons were walking on my mm -hmm. uh, we, we called our family doctor and the next appointment was three weeks, so we went to the 24 hour place and that's when they, just, they took chest x rays. So You spell Elise. I L I S E. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. I know y'all been praying with me with my uh, nephew. Well, he got two doctor's appointments uh, Monday and Tuesday, and he's doing good. Um, they've been living off some of his medicines that he's had, and so he, he's doing real good right now. She travels. What else? Cooper uh, hurt his ankle. Got to stay off of it for at least a week. Okay. I'm not sure how much longer after that, but it's not broken. Cooper Thomas, was it jumping off the stage? <laughs> What'd you do, Marsha? A 50 pound bag of mulch attacked me. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. I was spreading mulch all day and last bag, of course, the last bag, and I tripped over the wooden, you know, edging and went down and thankfully landed on mulch. <laughs> but I had a goose egg and a busted up ankle back home. I'm glad you can walk. Nobody was there to see it happen. That's the best part. All right. Anything else? 
Continue to pray for Dave and Kay Elton and all the others on our prayer list this week. <coughs> Let me pray with you. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be here and for hearing our prayers. Thank you for growing us, Lord. I pray that we would be um, spiritually wide-eyed um, and aware of everything going on in our society. Help us, Lord, to not uh, be naive about powers that be. I pray that you would help us to be active in our Christian walk as we carry the gospel with us wherever we go. Help us to remember the church exists to make disciples, to spread the gospel, to worship and to honor you. And Father, I pray that you would um, empower us and enable us to do that. Thank you for answered prayers in the past and for those we've lifted up tonight specifically that you would minister to them and they would uh, turn to you and trust in you. It's, it's one thing for us to ask you to, to be with them, but uh, truthfully, it's it's whether they're going to respond to you and turn to you and trust in you. And I pray that that would be the case. And Lord, I pray that you grow us here at Homewood. Grow us in our walk with you. Grow us in number. Uh, grow us in our vision and our maturity. And I pray that you would continue to do your work here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. You all have a good night. And Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday.